In this video, I'm going to show you how to do a factor analysis in Stata software. If you'd like to follow along, you can see a link to the data set I'm using here down in the notes to this show. And um, we'll go ahead and start here. You'll see in the drop downs up here, under various options, under factor, you'll find Principal Component Analysis, Exploratory Factor Analysis, and Confirmatory Factor Analysis. In this video, I'm going to show you Exploratory Factor Analysis. A lot of people erroneously use Principal Component Analysis when they mean to do Exploratory Factor Analysis or when that's Exploratory Factor Analysis is more appropriate. With Exploratory Factor Analysis, be aware that we assume that there is some underlying latent variable or latent trait and that these items that we have, or the questions we ask, the scale items, whatever they might be, um, are the way that people respond to them is due to this underlying latent um, variable, latent trait. So the latent trait causes you essentially to respond as you do. Or in other words, the latent trait causes the results that we get here for these various items. Principal component analysis, the theory is the other way around. Basically, the idea with principal component analysis is that I have a series of items, and by combining them together, we create um, a new variable as some combination of, of these variables. So sort of the causality works the other direction for principal components. And so most, most often, um, in the social sciences anyway, the exploratory factor analysis is what we're looking for if we're exploring latent traits. So we're going to go ahead and look at that. It's really quite easy, straightforward here. I have in this data set 20 fictional scale variables, um, which are Likert type items where we, you know, strongly disagree to strongly agree scales. I'm going to pop those over here. Now you'll notice over on this side it has these two symbols. The, that means your data needs to be either ordinal or scale, and not only does it need to be ordinal or scale, you need to have told data the data is ordinal or scale. Um, if not, it won't let you put the variables over here. To fix it, if it's not done the way it needs to be, is just click on this button here, look at your data, and you see here um, by clicking on this, you have your options. Scale is interval ratio, ordinal, and then nominal. So if your data is mistakenly listed as nominal, then it's not going to let you do, do a factor analysis with it. You'd need to change it to, to um, ordinal or scale. Of course, it wouldn't be appropriate to do it with just nominal data, except for maybe if it's just like binary in some cases. So we're going to go ahead and leave that as ordinal. Come back over here. And you can see it immediately pops up the results. It has these various defaults down here. And so we want to talk through them. We want to change them. The first thing that we need to think about when we're doing exploratory factor analysis is how many factors. There's a variety of ways that we can decide how many factors are the most appropriate here. When it comes down to it, you really want to go based on you know, having the number of factors is interpretable, an interpretable solution. It makes sense. Um, but there's some variety of rules of thumb to get you started. So let's look here, number of factors. They, by default, it does parallel analysis, which is really kind of the gold standard where essentially um, what the software is doing is, is looking to see if there is um, one factor what should these eigenvalues look like? If there were two factors, what should the eigenvalues look like? And so forth. Um, and then it, it, it gets the base solution based on that. Now, this parallel analysis by default is from principal components. We can click here to get one based on factor analysis. And you see immediately a shift in the output over there from just having one factor to having two factors. Okay. So that's one option. The other is the standard eigenvalues rule. It's got here. Um, it's very common. The simplest rule that been used in the past is the number of eigenvalues greater than one. Um, generally, you'll see when I clicked on that, it gave me five factors now, and I have, you know, some of these factors only have one or two items loading on them. Generally, um, using the eigenvalues greater than one rule is going to give you too many factors, more factors than are really interpretable for your data set. It's not always the case, but it's very common for that to occur. 
okay? So then the next rule is manual, which is basically I just tell it how many I want, okay? So maybe I tell it I want to have two factors is what I've decided I want, and it's going to just find a solution based on two factors then. Let's go back up to parallel analysis based on factor analysis. And you see there's this seed option here. The seed basically is because there's some randomness in, in how it, how it um, look, does a parallel analysis. If you have a matching seed with another person, and this was in here by default, you're going to get exactly the same results. Otherwise, you might get slightly different results. Or if you do this multiple times, you might get slightly different results if you don't have a seed in there telling it basically how exactly to do the randomization. So that's something just to be aware of. But I'm going to leave it there. Now, um, next thing, let's look look down here, is this estimation method. There's a variety of estimation methods that are commonly used, depending on the kind of data you have and so forth. Maximum likelihood is generally been considered the most common um, gold standard type of thing for factor analysis for most cases, okay? Um, there's a lot of cases in which you might want something different. For example, if you have data that's binary, you might want something different. If you have data that um, doesn't meet the statistical assumptions or requirements of maximum likelihood, you may want something different. Um, this is in a theory video. I'm going to tell you most of the time you want maximum likelihood. And what you really want to look on that to make sure maximum likelihood is appropriate is you want to look at basically to make sure you don't have extreme skewness or kurtosis. And that's something that you can look at by, by just looking at these descriptives up here. You can look at the skewness and the kurtosis. And very extreme. You know, there's always some skewness in liquid type data. Well, not always, but usually. Usually it's skewed one direction or another. And um, you just want it, if it's extreme, extreme, so that almost everybody is responding in the strongly gray category and there's a few in the gray and that's it or something like that, very extreme, then you might have some problems with this. these results not giving, being the best. However, again, this isn't a theory course. I'm just showing you the basics of how to do it here. Now we're going to look over at rotation, which chlorophyll clarifies your solution. By default, it does an oblique solution with Promax. Now there's orthogonal, there's oblique. An orthogonal solution, if I click on that, it's going to change some things. It's going to look quite different. Orthogonal um, solution assumes that the, any factors, if I have multiple factors, they're not very correlated with each other, okay? As minimally correlated as possible with each other. Um, well, oblique allows the factors to be correlated with each other, which is more reasonable for most social um, science type studies for if we've got two underlying human traits here, for them to be correlated to some degree. So that's, that's generally more reasonable. There's a variety of options. Under oblique, you'll get similar results for each one. I usually use Promax. It's quite commonly used. It's like just different mathematical methods to, to how the rotation is, is done. Um, orthogonal, you're going to see as well, variety of options, and Verimax is probably the most common. But by default, it gives you Promax, and that's commonly done. Okay, now that analysis can be based on the correlation covariance matrix, or, or this one. This is not um, most often it's done on the correlation matrix. That's what you're going to find in most software as being the default. Again, I'm not going to go into theory. Just be aware that there's some other options here. You can always click on the I option up here to open the, um, the help box. And it's highlighted that. And it's going to talk you through a variety of um, of options, okay, a variety of, of detail about what it offers here. It doesn't really give you enough theory for you to, to be helpful in knowing, making theoretical decisions, but it gives you some information about what's done here in the software. Okay, the next option, if we come down to output, you're going to see here first this highlight. You notice here that it's not giving me the loadings for both um, both factors for all the items. I can get that by, if you just scale that down to zero, I mean, sorry, let's get up to one. It's going to um, decide how many to give you. So a zero, it's going to 
um, it's basically telling you at what level it screens them out. So just to start with it at down at zero, you'll see here if any of any of them that have loadings, any loadings that are greater than zero, or, or really the absolute value of them greater than zero, so ignoring the negative sign, if any of the values are greater than zero, show them. Okay, well that would be all of them. And if we go up to one, anything you know that's one or greater, show it, which generally there isn't. Occasionally you can get a loading greater than one when there's problems in your data. But And by default I think it was at 0.4, which I think is too high. Um, there's a variety of theories out there exactly where you want to screen out the loading. Um, one um, theory is 0.32 is a pretty optimal spot. It's hard to get that. You could type it in there. I often put it, um, so for that reason, often we do, people put it at about 0.3. Um, I might do it at 0.2 so that I can see a little more. What am I doing here? Why am I doing this? Well, I'm again not going into theory in this particular video. It allows you to cleanly see what's going on a little bit more easily. Um, if I leave in as all of the values, again, this is just what's printed, was visible. That now in the true analysis, all these values are there. But looking at this quote is quite cluttery. It's hard for me to look at this right off and figure out which item loads on which factor because there's two values for every single item. So I have to, in my mind, kind of screen out, okay, well, item 13 is generally just on factor one. Um, I, you know, item two is just on factor one. If I go down um, here, maybe item 12, it's mostly on factor one, but not even exceptionally strongly there. And it's kind of more weak a little bit more weakly loaded, but in the you know negative direction on factor two. So I've got to look at all these and to figure out what's going on is a little confusing when I have all the numbers. So it's common and, and even public, often published even with some threshold screened out just visually so we don't have to look at them all. So if I put it you know, I can type in a value if I wanted it exactly 0 0.20, then I'm going to see any loading where the absolute value of that loading, so ignoring the negative sign, is greater than zero. And that allows me to see, well, these ones are a little bit cross-loaded, but it's quite weak in this case. Same thing here. You know, I've got, I've got a lot of these 0.2s. allows me to kind of see those ones that are weakly cross-loaded if I put it at 0.2. I might put it at 0.3, that's something I often do, Be, um, gives me, um, some will, some people will consider 0.3 a good threshold, or 0.32 more precisely is a good threshold for determining where things are cross-loaded. You know, don't just make the decision here based on what, you know, takes out all the cross-loadings. You want to have some theoretical reason for it. But at any rate, that's a common threshold that I'll actually use as the 0.3. Sometimes I'll look at it at 0.2 to just kind of see what's going on. Um, so about, about 0.3, I like to look at it. Okay, and so I've got this here. Next, I can have these ordered just by the size of the factors or the you know, which size of the loading, or I can have it in variable order, which generally makes more sense, I think, um, to have it in variable order. It's a little easier to find things, so you can order that either direction Okay, you can have it check some assumptions. I um, generally don't look at these particular things. What I particularly do is just look at the skewness and kurtosis of the variables to make sure nothing's ex really, really, really extreme. Um, you can look at some of these other outputs. They're not commonly looked at, um, the, the, these tables. Um, most often, um, the things that show up here are the things that are most often showed in a in results in a publication or something like that. Um, under the plots, the most commonly looked at thing will be often the scree plot. The scree plot is another basis for deciding how many factors. One, it just has the, you know, the eigenvalues plotted in order. And generally, you know, one guideline is that at the point at which the these dots, these points, don't look at the dotted one yet, but these regular points make a straight line that's we no longer have unique factors. So in other words, I have two points, one here, one here. 
before they start making a straight line. So I might have, I have two really significant factors going on. So that's one thing we look at, but it can also plot, unless you uncheck this box, what is found in the parallel analysis. So parallel analysis ba basically says, you know, if, you know, if we had ideally this number of factors, what would the eigenvalues look like? And, and it'll give me the solution as best as the one, is 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 the one where the number of points that basically appear above this dotted line. So that's one thing there. And of course, we have some options to how we're going to deal with our missing values because it's based on a correlation matrix. It um, by default is just going to include information or create calculate the correlation if um, a particular pair of observations has data for it. For both so like item three and item seven they both you know all the data pairs that have complete information for item three and item seven will be included in this analysis while list wise will take out anybody who's missing at all from these items has any information list missing so that's really the basics of the exploratory factor analysis here if you wanted to instead to do a principal components analysis because it was the more appropriate thing for you you would do the you know this again is my theory is actually my my new variable that i'm creating or new variables are a composition of these 20 variables rather than being just a reflection of them. So again, it looks very similar to the output. You know, I can do a parallel analysis based on either principal components or factor analysis. I can do a thorough or oblique. All of those kinds of things are the same. And you'll find down in the options here, most of the things are similar. I've got this option here for, whoops, for what I show. You know, for how you know how high, um, at what point we start screening these out, we can choose what order to put them in, and we can show some other things. I didn't show it in the the other one, but there is the option under tables to look at factor correlations, which is oft, often is something that's in, uh, meaningful and interesting. Is to look at in this case they're called components rather than factors, but to show how they correlate, how strongly they correlate with each other course scree plots and so forth. Um, in both cases you can look at a path diagram um, which is basically if you're familiar with confirmatory factor analysis it just creates the diagram that um, this EFA would make if, if modeled the way we typically do with a confirmatory factor analysis and I'm not going to talk about confirmatory factor analysis here but just be a aware this there is just showing that particular illustration.